presence among us. We thank you for the beauty of every aspect of what you've done this morning and the beauty of that song as the girls poured out their hearts in harmony to you. And Father, we just thank you that your love is like a circle that we take it in, we give it out, you give us more, we give it out. We just thank you for that, Lord. We, we thank you your love is so expressed, so embodied in your word. That, Lord, as we seek you in your word this morning, we know we will receive not just knowledge, but love. We will receive your presence in your word. And we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I recently saw an article, and the article was entitled, Why Children Need to Be Reminded Over and Over. And it was accompanied by a picture. You able to get that up for me, Matt? There we go. Why children need to be reminded over and over. Any moms ever feel like that? Yes. How many times have I told you? You don't ever listen. Amen. Well, some dads feel that way too. I was wondering if the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter ever got that way because it's clear that they had to keep reminding their followers over and over and over about things that they had already been taught. Just look at these words that Peter uses as he opens up the final chapter of his second letter. This is chapter 3, verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. See, Peter says, I, I've got to stir you up here to remember this. This is the second letter now. I already told you this stuff. This is a reminder. You've got to remember what the prophet said. You've got to remember what the apostle said. You've especially got to remember what Jesus said. So why is Peter so frantically concerned that we might forget what we've been taught? In verses 3 and 4, he warns what might happen if we aren't continually reminding ourselves of the things that we know to be true. Peter says this, know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. See, Peter knows that the world, the people who are not following God, they actually want to live in disobedience to God's standards, and they are looking for ways to ignore God and to pretend that His judgment won't ever come. They want to believe that they can live their lives any old way, any which way they choose, with no possibility of consequences for their actions. Well, that's simply a fantasy. And Peter addresses the unreality of that self-delusion that it doesn't really matter how I live, God doesn't care how I live, and God's not going to judge how I live. Peter says this in verses 5 and 6, for when they maintain this, in other words, when they, they act that way, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. See, Peter's going to explain in these next few verses that the idea of God not judging is a foolish gamble to take. In fact, somebody I was reading recently pointed out this, that instead of thinking God has simply forgotten to, how to judge or that he cares about judging, we could look around and, and realize that God actually has a pretty good reputation for judging and judging pretty harshly. 
For example, if you own a home, you probably have a homeowner's policy. And in your homeowner's policy, there are exclusions. And one of the exclusions in your homeowner's policy is they won't cover what are called acts of God. <laughs> See, your insurance agents, he don't want to play against God. If God's going to judge you, he's going to say, yeah, well, that wasn't in the policy. And what, what, are, what are generally considered acts of God? Things that we consider natural disasters. You may not be covered against a certain type of tornado or a certain type of earthquake, a tsunami. Though they're acts of God. Now, I'm not sure they are acts of God in the strictest sense. What I'm saying is I don't think that God necessarily stirred up a storm that we called Superstorm Sandy and said, I want to wipe out a bunch of homes. I don't think God did that specifically. God allowed that, but I believe the origin of Superstorm Stan Sandy and all these natural disasters happened in the Garden of Eden. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, not only did, did death enter their world, it entered the whole world. And even the natural world, even the wind and, and, and the storms and the earthquakes, all of that, is, we're told in the Bible, is the earth groaning, the creation groaning. The, the, we live in a sick world. Not only are people sick, but the world is sick. And the world is twisted and it's turning and it's creating earthquakes and there's wind patterns that are being stirred up. And that's part of God's judgment on sin from long ago. But Peter's saying this, listen, there's a day coming when God is going to move specifically and he's going to unleash a real act of God in his final judgment. Peter says in verse 7, by his word, by God's word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. See, he already made reference to the fact that God created a world and then judged that world with water. In Noah's day, God poured forth his judgment with water. Now we know he won't do that again. Why? Because he told Noah that he would never flood the earth again. And he gave Noah a sign of that promise, which is a rainbow. Anytime you see a rainbow in the sky, just remember that that was the sign, the covenant that God made with Noah. He's not going to flood the world again. Will there be floods? Yes. Will he destroy the world with a flood? No. But remember in chapter 2, verse 6, uh, Peter had said this, remember how God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by reducing them to ashes? Well, he's saying this, it's not going to be a flood. It's going to be fire that's going to come and judge the world this time. Now, the problem is for the mockers and the scoffers, they say, Noah's flood, what was that? 6,000 years ago? Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, what? Three, 4,000 years ago? I think God's on vacation from judging, personally. That's what they say. I, don't, I haven't seen God judge in a long time. He's certainly not judging me, they say. Well, the problem is they're forgetting some things. And this is what Peter goes on to now. He says this, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years. A thousand years like one day. Peter's actually reminding them, again, reminding them, that's what Psalm 90 verse 4 said. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday which passes by, or as a watch in the night. Peter's reminding the scoffers, he's reminding the mockers, and he's reminding the believers that God is sovereign over time. God created time. Time doesn't control God. God is not limited by time. And you know, this, can, this understanding is important for us, not just in terms of the eternal judgment, but it affects us sometimes when we pray. Because we are in a time-centered world. And we see things on a basis of time. And sometimes we pray for things, and then maybe a day later, maybe a week later, maybe an hour later, we're like, uh, God, uh, listen, I, I prayed that thing, and... Uh, you. <laughs> but there's an old gospel song, Pastor Roger, says he may not come when you want, but he's right on time. 
See, God will do things in his time. And Peter points this out in verse 9. He says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. See, we need to understand, and we need to help the world to understand, that what seems to be a long delay in Christ's return, what seems to be a long delay in God pouring forth his judgment, is simply a sign of his mercy. The Bible says mercy triumphs over justice. God will bring his justice, but in the meantime, he's holding it back because of his mercy. If he decided to judge the world today, he could do it. If he decided to judge the world tomorrow, he could do it. And you know what? Sometimes we as believers get into this mindset and we're saying, God, just come and judge everybody. He could if he wanted to. But you know what? When we say that, we, we show that we don't have the merciful heart that he has. We say, God, just take me home and, and kill the heathen. And God says, but I love them. But I want to wait and give them a chance, an opportunity to hear the gospel. Listen, the thing is this, is God going to wait forever? No, he's not going to wait forever. When will he finally decide for judgment to come? Here's what Peter says about that in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and all its works will be burned up. So here we see this phrase and we'll see it often in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I want you to learn to recognize it when you see this phrase. The phrase is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord will be the pouring out of God's divine judgment. And we can see it all the way back in Isaiah chapter 13. Verses 9 through 11, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars from heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises. The moon will not shed its light. Thus, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. God's very specifically saying, I know there's mockers out there. I know there's scoffers out there. I know there's some who aren't going to turn to me. But I want to give those whose hearts could be softened to come to me a chance. Then I will judge the mockers. Then I will judge the scoffers. Oh, I'm coming. There will be a day of the Lord. The prophet Joel speaks about it twice. He says in Joel 1.15, For the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Then Joel says in chapter 3, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. It's those multitudes that God wants to reach. They're in the valley of decision. They're lost just like you and I were. We were all in the valley of decision at one point. We all had to make a choice to follow God or to not to follow God. We were all in that place. Thank God that he didn't come while you were still in the valley of decision. And you understand that that's what his mercy is, that while there are still multitudes in this valley of decision, he's going to hold back his judgment and basically say to them, choose. And we have to be the ones to help them to make the right choice. In God's mercy, he's saying, it'll come, but not yet. And he says, when it does come, Peter says, it's going to come like a thief. And Paul uses the same phrase in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Jesus himself used that same metaphor. He wanted to show how unexpected his return would be. Luke 12, 39 and 40. Jesus said, be sure of this. That if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too, be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. So, let me say this. 
even if you've read the whole Left Behind series <laughs> two or three times, you have no idea. None of us do. Because it'll come like a thief. Now the thing is, we are told to look for signs. We are told that there will be indications that it's getting closer. Why are we given those signs? To understand the urgency. To understand the urgency for us to be ready and to understand that we've got to reach those multitudes in the valley. I explained to you before as we looked in the Gospels, Jesus uses an analogy about the signs. He says they're like birth pangs. When a woman's going through travail, what do we know about the birth pangs for a lady? I don't know this firsthand, I just know of it. As the baby's getting closer, two things happen. The birth pangs get closer together, they get more intense. Jesus is saying to us, when you see the signs getting closer together, man, there was an earthquake yesterday and another one today and another one tomorrow. They're getting closer. When the earthquakes become more intense, they're not Richter scale 6, they're Richter scale 10, they're Richter scale 13, and you didn't even know that went that high. The signs are coming. We need to get urgent about this. We are too complacent about reaching the lost. But the signs should be indicating to us it's time. The time is drawing near. I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime or my daughter's lifetime, your lifetime. I don't know. I know this. It's getting closer. And there are multitudes in the valley of decision. When that day comes, Peter says, the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and all its works will be burned up. This is very similar to the description that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 24 when he said, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Why will they mourn when Jesus returns? Because they made the wrong choice in the valley. Do you understand? When he comes, they can't say, I changed my mind. They will be judged. And I want to give you a little limited perspective of what this might look like when that happens. I, I read this story. I was fascinated by it because I, I, I enjoy history. Uh, I never had heard this before. There was a city. I don't think it exists today because of what you'll hear about it. It was called Port Royal. A story in Jamaica. Maybe they rebuilt it. I don't know. A uh, place in Jamaica. Uh, June 7th, 1692. At that time, Port Royal was possibly the wickedest city on earth. Kind of like Corinth when Paul wrote uh, to the Corinthians. It was, a, it was a pirate's headquarters. It had all kinds of filth and wickedness and certainly ungodliness. And, and according to the reports, it literally sank into the Caribbean. And, and, and there were a few survivors, not many, but this is an eyewitness account of what happened that day. The earth heaved and swelled like rolling billows, and in many places the earth cracked open, open and shut with a quick motion and fast. In some of these openings, people were swallowed up. In others, they were caught in the middle and then pressed to death. The whole thing was accompanied by the noise of falling mountains, while the sky turned dull and red like a glowing oven. Over 2,000 people died in that chaotic day. And to this day, many people believe in Jamaica that that destruction was God's judgment on the evil of Port Royal. When we look at stories like this and when we read these verses, we have to ask ourselves something. What's the ultimate reason that the Holy Spirit has spoken through Peter to put this warning in there? Why is Peter frantically, like the mom in that picture saying, listen to me! I'm telling you something here. I got to remind you over and over, this is important. What does God want people to do once they realize that his judgment is coming? It may be delayed, but it is coming. Here's what Ezekiel says. 
In Ezekiel chapter 18, God speaks and says, If a wicked man turns away from all the sins he has committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, he will surely live and not die. None of the offenses he has committed will be remembered against him. Because of the righteous things he has done, he will live. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? God is looking at the multitudes in the valley of decision and he's saying, choose me. Choose my son. Choose to live. See, the ultimate issue isn't whether God is going to bring judgment. He is. And the ultimate issue isn't even when God is going to bring judgment. Because he will do it when he's ready. And when he does, it will happen like a thief in the night. People won't be expecting it. They're going to still be in the valley of decision. And just like we saw some of the vignettes in, in the play, they're going to say, but I've got lots of time still. That's one thing we have to explain to people. This is one thing. That's why if you can get some neighbors to watch Billy Graham's special or get it on DVD and show it to them, people think they have time. Nobody knows how much time they have. Nobody. People are young. They think they're going to live forever. None of us are. So it's not a matter of if God's going to bring judgment. It's not a matter of when God's going to bring judgment. The only issue that matters is who will be ready when God brings his judgment. Who will be ready? And that includes us. I'm not saying being ready because we're saved or not saved. I, I, I would hope that those who are here today have made a choice to give their lives over to Jesus Christ, to accept his forgiveness for what he did on the cross. But even to believers, Jesus gives this warning in Luke 21. Watch out that your hearts are not weighed down by carousing, strong drink, and the worries of life. Do not let that day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come rushing upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. But stay alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all those things about to happen and to stand before the Son of Man. See, Jesus says, don't get weighed down. We come and accept Jesus into our lives and sometimes the world that we live in just wants to suck us back down to the way things used to be before we knew Jesus. Jesus says, don't get weighed down with that stuff. That stuff doesn't matter anymore. Stay alert. Pray. Make sure that you are on the path you need to be on. Because that's the only thing that's going to matter. And, and I want to ask uh, Sean and Jaquana to come up here. We're going to close with a song here. And, and, and this song, to me, tells us where our hearts need to be towards the coming of Jesus. Because we're not, as believers, we're not running away from something. We're not running away from the judgment. We should be running towards something. We should be running towards Jesus with all we're worth and saying, use me, Jesus. Use me to reach those who are in that valley of decision. I also want to point this out to you that this particular song is written by Daniel Bashta. He's the fellow that's going to be coming and doing the concert here in a couple weeks on a Sunday night. And if you really like this song, and I certainly like it, I hope you'll enjoy it. I would encourage you to come out to the concert and hear many, many other great songs like this.
everything away Till all I have is you Undo the veil So all I see is you Pursue your presence. I will pursue you. I will pursue your presence. I'm coming after you. Pass me by I'm breaking through the boundaries I will not be denied No I will pursue you I will pursue your presence I can't live without your presence. I can't live without your presence. I can't live without your presence. 